Welcome everyone to Expat Hoops. We're live with you today and we're going to talk to basketball players who have played their pro careers outside of the U.S. as you're used to. Today we talk to a former guest, Philadelphia's Tyreek Duran. He started for St. John Newman and St. Marie Goretti Catholic High School before attending LaSalle, where he earned uh, Atlantic 10 Conference second team recognition. For two consecutive years, he was a key part of LaSalle's 2012-2013 Sweet 16 squad. Last year, we sat down with Tyreek in episode 21, which you can find on our YouTube page and all the places you can find audio podcasts. I also have it pinned on the page, so you can just go to our main page uh, at some point after you're done with this and take a look at what he told us about the early part of his career uh, since we talked to him. And uh, he played in Cyprus, Poland, Greece, and Hungary over that period of time. But today we're here to talk to him, to catch up with him after a season which he spent uh, for Club Atletico Aguada in Uruguay. Uh, we're not going to be judging me on the pronunciation here, but uh, <laughs> that team is based in Montevideo, and we'll spend a good amount of time on that, but we'll also be taking listener questions. So use the chat feature, subscribe to our channel, and let's get into it with Tyreek. Uh, last time you were on Tyreek, we had so much content. It was great talking to you, and you said, this is like therapy for me, and that's a line that we've actually used with a lot of other guests since then, and they've basically co-signed that. Uh, so with that, <laughs> welcome back to therapy. Oh, man, thanks for having me. It's good to, uh, you know, get everything off my chest once once again, you know, and uh, recap everything I went through for, with another good but rough season. <laughs> yeah, and like we said off the top, it was in Uruguay. Um, it's a little bit of a departure from where you'd been in the world before. So take us back to at some point in time between when we last sat down with you a year ago uh, to the point in time that you were fielding offers, what were kind of like some of the things that you were looking at and what made you decide to go go to Uruguay? Um, to be honest, I was it was another one of those years where I was I was thinking about, you know, leaving a little later um, and just spending more time home with the family. Uh, the whole thing was I wanted to spend Thanksgiving and Christmas home this year. So that was that was really big on my plate. But um, like towards the end of the summer, I ended up finding out that I was having a baby. So uh, that kind of swayed my decision to leave, you know, to make try to make some more money before I end up having a child. Who knows how expensive the, uh, a child could be. So um, I ended up decide I want to say around September I had a few offers in Europe but you know Europe was coming in with low ball offers again which they have been trying to do for like the last two years because of COVID you know blaming a lot of things on COVID so South America came through with an offer that was pretty much triple what I was going to make in Europe so ended up uh, taking that offer and uh, starting a new experience in a different country. And so what were some of the, the pros, uh, or actually when you got to Uruguay, um, what was it like getting used to life off the court there when you first got there? Um, it, it wasn't even, it wasn't difficult at all. To me, I've been playing overseas so long. So to me, that adjustment just happened. You know, wherever you are, you make the adjustment. Um, the good thing about it was the, the time difference was only, I think it was, I want to say it was two hours before daylight savings. Um, then once they like say and said, I think it was back to an hour or something. I can't remember the exact change, but I know it wasn't no more than two hours, which is which was a big thing for me because uh, I never been I never been somewhere where we were on a, pretty much the same time frame as I was as the people back home. So that was good. I got to talk to my family um, during normal hours. I didn't have to stay up extra late or talk, talk to them during weird hours on their time frame. So that was another big thing. But as far as everything else, just getting used to being there. That like I said, that happens. You know. You uh, get out, walk around, and get familiar with the city, the town, you know, the streets, and all of that. So the only thing that was weird for me was they don't they don't get players uh, vehicles out there. Everybody catches Uber, so mm -hmm. that was the that was the main adjustment for me. I didn't really I didn't really like that at first, and they didn't even tell me until I got there. Like I, I think the first day, one of the people from the staff picked me up and took me to um ended up taking me to practice. So you know I'm thinking okay I'll, I'll get the car at practice. You know, I end up finishing practice and I'm just waiting there. I'm like, all right, where the guy that, you know, dropped me off the practice? He's like, oh, no, uh, you got to take an Uber. All right, so when were y'all going to tell me this? You know what I mean? I didn't have, I didn't even have Uber downloaded on my phone. So I was like, Some, listen, somebody got to take me back home. I'm not about to be stranded out here. Or, you know what I mean? And, the, and it's not like the gym was close. Like, I, I was thinking, okay, well, if I don't have a car, then the gym must be walking distance or something. Because I, I talked to one of my teammates and he said he used to always walk to the uh, to that gym. Uh, it, the, the first first week was kind of weird, man. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, you you wouldn't expect to to have to go around a city for a team with Uber. Um, how how was yeah. that? Like, were they easy to find in Montevideo? But well, Ubers. Yeah. Yeah, I, hadn't, I mean, they were easy to find, but of course you had your days where you order Uber and the driver cancels right before you, they're supposed to come pick you up, or the um like the the connection is just acting weird. You know, with the it's like it. Like anything with the internet, like your connection might be acting weird one day, and uh, it was it was a lot. Like I, I had a couple of times where I was late to practice, or say they want us to a game by seven forty, you know, to be in the locker room and everything, and I don't get there until almost eight fifteen because I can't find the Uber. Yeah. And me and my um, I know some some people on other teams they all had like drivers or or yeah, they, most of them had drivers or their teammates to come get them, but like with us, we didn't we didn't have that so. I think around like December, back when Jarvis Fernando was on that team, we talked to him. He's like, "Listen, can y'all just can y'all find us a, um, a driver or something? Like y'all y'all giving us money for Uber? Why not just get us a driver so that we can have a consistent way to the gym?" And they didn't want to do it, so yeah, the problems with the Ubers were they were in and out throughout the season. Yeah, I, I kind of noticed that too. Um, I went to LA on vacation, and it was kind of the same deal. Um, a lot of people just don't want to drive for Uber for whatever reason, you know, because of the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. Um, so tell us a little bit uh, more about Montevideo. I've I've heard such good things about it, you know, culturally and as a place to visit um, off the court. Uh, what did you get into there? Uh, I didn't go out at all, to be honest. I went to, um, hmm. I didn't go to any clubs, anything. My, my only thing is this year, I, I wanted to like, you know, get out and explore. Uh, so I, I got to tour like the city and see like some of the, like, historical aspects like a couple of the, um they got like this thing called the rambler where everybody like it's, it's like a big path where everybody runs and heading in the water and everything i'm sorry can y'all hear that in the background no actually oh all right, that's, uh, that's crazy um but yeah uh so i, I got out a lot and kind of explored i uh, went to a lot of restaurants and uh so I, like i looked up a lot of that food or i talked to my teammates and you know like what's the what's the main food out here I try a lot of their food, uh, but for the most part, like on my off days, I just walk around the city um, and try to explore as much as I can. Just, you know, like I said, because I didn't have a car, so you kind of got to adjust to that. Like you can't just drive around, you got to walk around. So if something wasn't more than like a 30 minute walk, I just walk there, you know, just to, um, just to get familiar with the streets or you never know what you might see when you're walking. Like you're more. I feel like you're more observing when you're walking somewhere rather than uh, driving. So yeah, a lot. Of, I did a lot of walking out there. <laughs> By far, the most walking I did in my career off the court. And I was going to say, depending on where you are in your career, I mean, you're from Philadelphia. Um, you know, depending on what your familiarity is with a city and everything, um, how is Montevideo in terms of walkability, uh, public transit? Um, you know, I know that you had an Uber, but maybe that was part of the reason why the team. Uh, decided to do that other than maybe saving a little bit of money yeah uh so i mean a lot of people out there like a lot of people that i met they, they'll tell you like yeah you know you just catch the bus on here we don't do uber like the bus pay like a dollar for a day or something it was somewhere like the bus pay it was real cheap but once again i'm in a different country so i'm not really i'm not comfortable catching a bus you know just hopping on it and not knowing where it's taking me and i'm like i guess everything is in spanish i don't really know much spanish so i wasn't really uh too comfortable with that but um, other than that, the city, I don't know, it's a weird city because one minute you'll be in like a nice area and then you'll just see like a bunch of homeless people. And it's just like, wait, what? Like everybody kept telling me like, oh, you're, you live in a nice neighborhood. And I'm like, in Philadelphia, when you see like homeless people roaming around and you see drug addicts, I'm like, that, that's the sign that you're not in a nice neighborhood. So that was that was another funny thing with me. And another weird thing was everybody has dogs out there. And if you're walking around, you literally have to walk with your head down because it's like there's dog shit everywhere. Like every 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 ten feet, you're probably seeing some dog poop. And if you if you're not paying attention, you're almost ninety nine percent going to step in dog poop. So that was another thing that was just like funny to me that like uh, you got to make that crazy adjust. Like even when my girlfriend came out there, she uh I had to warn her like yo like be more observant when you're walking. It's like of what like like not of people but of dog poop. <laughs> she didn't understand it her first day and then like the second day she we, i forget where we were walking it might have been like the grocery store somewhere we're literally dog, dog uh, dodging dog poop left and right on the ground it's so like everybody you know everybody you see out there has a dog 
and you'll see a lot of loose dogs out there. Like out back home, you might see loose cats, but like stray cats out there, they have like a big, <laughs> a big stray dog problem. So it's funny though, man. It's, like yeah, that is something weird thing. that the U.S. doesn't really have much of a problem with the stray dogs, but a lot of other places have yeah. have some issues with that. Um, yeah, it is big in South America too. Like, uh, yeah, most countries in South South America. and Central America. Yeah, any any Latin yeah. American country are going to have that problem a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely strange when you uh, when you see it in person, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're from Philly, but like um, in the burbs, especially around here, like <laughs> that kind of stuff happens. <laughs> like people will chase after you out of your house or something and uh, have you clean that up. <laughs> yeah, it is it, it, it weird, man. It was a, definitely a big adjustment for me. I just I didn't understand it at first. I'm just like, how do how do so many people just lose their dog? <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of on the court stuff, uh, when it comes to the challenge the the overall quality of the league and the play uh where would you say that ranks in terms of places that you've been because you've been to a lot of countries so far you've been in a lot of leagues yeah as far as overall like difficulty uh it's probably at the bottom like it was to me it was i i, I was telling talking to somebody um yesterday at the game i was at the pro am in philly and i was like it was by far the easiest money i made i guess i mean of course it's basketball is going to be basketball but i'm like in europe you're you're practicing twice a day. Your coaches expect you to run a lot of X's and O's. And out there, it's just like, all right, you're our import. Like, just go get us a bucket. Like, you just, just make sure we win. And um, I don't know, a lot of their a lot of their players over there, like their local players, aren't as talented as uh, teams when you go to Europe. So, for the most part, it's, it's like three Americans versus the other three Americans on the other team. Like, very few teams out there have, like, high level um local players so for the most part most of the games you're playing you're going to be challenged just because everybody plays defense and the rest are terrible so a lot of people out there just be fouling and they can't really guard <laughs> they can't really keep up with the americans so but then they're like oh yeah just go out there play hard and uh, make the american work but them making american work is just all right yeah follow them so, yeah, i don't to me it was it was by far the <laughs> bottom tier of, uh, of overall talent You've heard of Hack a Shack. Well, this is Hack a Tyreek in this case. Yeah, it was bad, man. That's, and it's funny if you like look at the Twitter, like after every game, the fans are always complain like how many how many foul shots I should I should shoot every game. But I feel like once the refs know you and you know they get familiar with you, they're like, all right, we're not gonna uh, we're not gonna call any fouls for this guy. Like we're gonna, like the fix is in. Like just make him work. <laughs> like, we'll call every every other foul. I mean, we're recording this uh, on a live that was after what game five of the NBA finals, where there was a little bit of complaining about the the officiating as I'm, I'm sure you've seen not only the game, but also some of the complaints about the officiating, but uh, you know, you've, you've also, I mean, other guests have also told us about the officiating overseas. Um, so exactly how bad are we talking here relative to even some of the other spots or compare and contrast with, you know, an NBA fan watching these games and being like, no, the finals times 10 each game. Man, it's the only way I could describe it. So I was in Hungary last year, and I thought Hungary at that point was the worst I've ever seen. This league by far trumped that, like by by 10 levels. And it was to the point where we would be in games and you're just looking at the refs and it's like, what did y'all do to even become referees? Like, that's how bad it was. Like, they didn't, they don't know how to control the games. Like, they wouldn't. It'd be certain plays, and you just you're just staring at the ref like, how could you even make that call? How could you miss that call? Like you're right there, to the point that even the fans would complain a lot and like and tell me like they'll be DMing me saying, you know, uh, we're sorry about the referees, man. They're so bad. It's uh, it's wow. it's hard for us to enjoy, it's hard for us to enjoy the games because you know they kind of control it in a way that's like that's unwatchable or I don't know, like especially in the playoffs when like the when it was so many people and in the crowd and um. And they're all cursing the refs out because they're making so many calls. So it's like the the more the refs got cursed out, the worse that they got. So when the playoffs started, it was like it was atrocious. Like we, it, it, for the most part, whoever the uh, home team was was going to win. Mm-hmm. So like we played, we played one team. I think the first round of the playoffs, um, we beat them pretty easily at home. And then we went to their place and they beat us by twenty. And they were nowhere near 20, 25 points better than us. But it was just the fact that we were on the road. I think they uh like they they would like every game they would foul like two of our two of our main players would be in foul trouble. You never knew who it was gonna be, but two players were for sure being foul trouble in the first half. 
So like every, we were literally playing five on eight every game, like five against eight every game, and it was it just got worse and worse as the season going on. Like the in the regular season, it was bad, but when we got to the playoffs. <laughs> it's like the rest took it up to another level. So we've been overwhelmingly, you know, negative so far. Are there any positives you took from the uh, experience, really? I mean, we talked about significance and that kind of stuff. Is there anything that you think that you can take with you to, to as you go on with your career? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. For me, I mean, I had I had a good season, so I'm not, you know, I'm not really, I'm not going to complain about it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, like the basketball, as far as like my team, I had a I had a good team. Like it was, it was probably like four, five teams maybe that were like. They were like ultimately competitive, but um, for me, I just I feel like I learned how to play in a different way. Like they used me as a point guard and a scorer, but like the, for the most part of the se- first half of the season, I was coming off the bench, which I didn't mind because I was still playing starting minutes. I was leading the team in scoring. I didn't mind that at all. And then um, I think we lost a few games, and they were asking, you know, they were coming up to me saying they were talking to the coach, like the GM would talk to me saying, you know, we want the coach to play you more. He actually wants you in the start lineup. So then I start. I, I'm starting again. I'm still scoring or whatever. And then I he changed the coach again. I'm coming off the bench, or I was starting, and then I came off the bench. Then I end up starting. It was a lot of up and downs, but as far as like overall, um, I think the positive thing I take out of it was just uh, I don't I don't even know what I could say. It was just like it's hard to not. Ah, I'm trying to think how I could break this down. Cause like it wasn't it wasn't bad on the court like it was all good on the court like we had a uh, like I said we had a phenomenal year we probably would have made the championship had our team not gotten hurt like I think we lost about four players due to injury towards the end of the season so it was on the court it was nothing but positivity like I enjoyed every moment of that we had probably one of the best fan bases there I think that was an, um, the main positive for me like we that was literally the best team I played against I played for that uh, where the fans were so engaged. Like every game, as far as even Twitter, Instagram, like I'm sure y'all see, like social that social media presence was very, very heavy. Um, even if you look at any of the uh, videos, like from our playoffs, um, the fans are going crazy, like, it's, um, filling out the re- arenas and everything. Uh, it was a lot. Uh, it was a lot of positivity. I'm not gonna. It's not all bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was definitely something that threw out the course of the year that, you know, we we would uh, – some teams are better than others uh, when we have, you know, guests from the pod and everything and catching up with them. And it was pretty easy to do that with your team. And uh, also, to your point, uh, I think towards the end of the season, um, you know, when you uh, were, were leaving the country, I think I saw plenty of messages, you know, thanking you uh, a little bit, you know, in my limited understanding of Spanish and some in English as well. <laughs> so I uh, can definitely attest to that. Um, so one of the things I think that we kind of want to get to is, you know, you mentioned the composition a little bit that there's, you know, three Americans per team. Um, and you said about five of the teams were competitive about how many, uh, teams were there in the league and where does it range, uh, in the country? Because Montevideo, big, big city, um, and are they really concentrated in the big cities or are you kind of going to some rural areas as well? So another good thing about uh, Uruguay is, is probably like 14 teams, but they're all they're all in that city. So the farthest we we went for a game, I think, was probably like 25 minutes to a half hour. Every other team we played was literally like 10, 15 minutes away from where I stayed at. So we I we were we were doing no traveling at all. Like, and you know in Europe you, uh, and that was another reason I went I went to Uruguay. Uh, I forgot to mention because I. Um, heard that you don't you don't travel anywhere like all the teams are close um you don't have no road trip uh any game you have like i said the, the farthest you'll be going is probably 30 minutes maybe um and that was another reason i hated europe you know, some places in europe like poland hungary we were taking hungary we were taking six hour bus trip the day of game it's like i know that's unheard of like take a six hour bus trip this is the day of the game and then get off and play and your coach is just looking at you like all right yeah, go do your job I don't care how long we just travel. And it's like, I, what am I supposed to do out here after traveling for six hours on a bus? So that was another um, big positive about uh, being in Uruguay, the, uh, the whole travel aspect. Um, so in terms of where you go from here, um, what are your thoughts on the, the your career going forward from here? 
as far as like where do I want to play or what do yeah. you mean? Or do you want to play? You know, are you going to continue? Like spend some time at home? Um, I, I for sure I want I want to play. I think I still got a couple of years left in me. Uh, like I said, I was I looked pretty good last year. You know, uh, besides the injury part of it, um, but that's a part of the game. Uh, it's just a matter of me having a son now and trying to figure out how to cope with that. And I, I honestly don't think I'm going to do more than I don't think I'm going to do a whole season uh, overseas. I don't know how people have babies and leave their kids and go do a whole nine months overseas. Like that's that's something I don't even think about. Like it's, I know I know for sure I couldn't do that. So I'm um, getting closer to the season. I'll figure that out. But like I said, I'll probably end up leaving halfway through the season. It's, I don't think it's any any possibility that I leave in August or September. It's just too soon. I'm I'm enjoying being a dad too much. I like seeing my son, you know, grow up every month. You know, you see something different every month. Uh, you have a newborn, so and I, I don't really I don't know what's in store for me. I don't mind where I would go. Uh, like I said, I, I want at this point in my age, it's all about the money, and I think seeing new places. Like I want to see as many different countries as I can. So I'm not sure. Maybe I will repeat a country, but and at the end of a at the end of the day, I kind of want to. Um, be in a different country that I've never experienced before. Do you have a list of countries that you're thinking of just by chance? Just uh, places that maybe you uh, you you want to take off a box, you want to get off your bucket list before you retire? Yeah, so it's definitely Israel, Spain, and Italy as far as Europe goes. And um, for South America, I think uh, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and what was the other country? Mexico, Puerto Rico. Actually, that might be it. Uh, for sure, Mexico and Puerto Rico. I heard Puerto Rico pays really good, and uh, I heard they put you in pretty good apartments right by the water. And uh, same for Mexico. I mean, you know, and they're both the, the the positive side of it. They're both close to the U.S. So if family wanted to come out and visit, it'd be ten times easier rather than being in Europe where you're probably taking an overseas flight. I mean, a, like a fourteen hour overseas flight. Most people in my family don't want to uh, fly too far, so I feel like Mexico, Puerto Rico, would be perfect. Just, just so they can see me play, because a lot of my family has, hasn't seen me playing playing since uh since college. Yeah, we One haven't of the had things, this uh, about you know you mentioned a little bit before off the pod that the play style difference, and I think you actually mentioned it very earlier on in this uh, on live as well. Uh, play style difference between Europe and South America. Uh, I'm not sure if that's something that has gone its way to Mexico or Puerto Rico. Uh, or if that's something that you've heard, but uh, is it more appealing to probably stay in South America, not only because of the lack of really a time zone difference or, or negligible, but also because of the play style? Or, or do you think that you probably, I mean, let me put it to you that way. Do you prefer the South American style? And also it sounds like you're doing a lot less practicing than Europe as well. Yeah. So from my vision, from what I saw last year, from the season that just passed, the uh, the whole outlook of it is, I mean, the whole outlook I would prefer to be in South America. Like you said, like I told you, we, we practice a lot less. Now we practice a lot less. We only have one practice a day, which in Europe, you're most likely practicing twice a day, going who knows what in the morning. Then afternoon practice is regular practice. And uh, like you said, also the play style is just more, I think it's more up and down. Um, like I said, less less X and O's. And uh, it's just, to me, it's, more, it's a more complete, like a more fun game. Whereas, like, uh, I'm not going to say it's just entertainment. Like, you still have to be, like, a smart basketball player. You're not just out there going up and down, up and down, you know, doing anything. But it's just, like, they're not – I feel like they don't hold you back in South America. Like, your coach lets you go. Whereas in Europe, sometimes you tend to get a coach that might try to put a leash on you and, like, oh, yeah, we know you're good. We know you can do this, that, and the third. But, you know, I want you to do this. Like, I don't want you to do all the stuff that you can do. So I think that part of South America um, – and, and, like I said, it's close – to America, to, um, the U.S. So it's like you said, it's just more appealing. You know, it's just it's like why would I want to go back to South America? I mean, over to Europe where I can stay right here, I can stay closer, make more money. You know, worst case scenario, I'm I, I'm not making as much money. I mean, I'm not making um I'm making the same amount as in Europe, but like you said, I'm, I'm still closer. So I just think like the pros are the pros outweigh the cons when it comes to South America for sure. <laughs> So a couple questions from the, uh, the Gola boys, um, up at <laughs> your alma mater. Um, they'd like to know what can LaSalle do to be relevant again in college basketball? To be relevant again. Ah, that's, that's, that's honestly a, a, a tough question because 
isn't it though the, the college basketball scene changed so much since i i went there and you know now with the uh, what's the, the ellen ellen i or L, what is it again what's the name of it name image and likeness so and uh nil 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 yeah yeah so with that i think that just made it even tougher for LaSalle because you know a lot of them big schools, they are the one they're the ones with the boosters. So it's like the the bigger the school, I feel like the bigger the boosters you're gonna get. And I was actually just up there a couple of days ago. I was talking to um talking to the academic advisor about that and just how like it's like we were talking, we were discussing how it's gonna change the game of college basketball forever and it's probably not gonna be for the better. And we were talking about how like a, a kid, I think it was I think it was a kid from Miami, uh they had two deal. They they both had deals, but one had a deal bigger than the other, and it caused a it caused like a little rift between between the player and I guess the spot the guy that was giving him the deal or like you know what I mean like it's when you put things in a in a money perspective I feel like you're you're asking for too many problems, and she was explaining it to me how you know now like the kids are getting money for rent where they get like nine hundred dollars a month or something or six hundred dollars a month and I'm like. To be honest, that's all they had to do ever. They that's all they had to ever do with college kids. Like we weren't asking for a, a big lump sum of payment, like but just something that's livable. Like you know, you, you can't go nine months without a job, and then they they thought your Pell Grant check for like two grand, and all right, like all right, this is this is for you to survive for uh, <laughs> for a semester. You like you'll run out of that. But as far as the style being relevant, I I just don't know. I honestly don't know what they could do because it's such a it's such a small school. Like yeah, we have. We have some type of history, but when you got like surrounding schools with better campuses, I feel like with Temple, St. Joe's, I feel like the, all them kids are just more drawn into going there, um, and it's it's hard to compete with that. I know but there are plans for potentially a new arena. Uh, do you think that would help any? Yeah, so I, I, like I said, I was up there a couple of days ago, and they were talking about that. And the, the plan that they do got is is actually very deep. Like it's it's a, it's a very cool plan that they're doing. But it's not going to be available for like another two or three years, I think he said. I think they said uh, for sure that whole all their games this year are going to be at the Palestra. And I, I want to say part of next year. But I think that could also help because even with that, it's like we don't have no we don't have a practice facility. Like we have one gym. Other um other people use that gym also. Yeah, there happens to be a pool in it somewhere, as you uh yeah, it's a, it's a as pool. everyone happens to talk about with uh, Tom Gola Arena. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a pool in there, but it's just like I said when you got uh when you got other other schools around the area that that offer all of that. Like even Penn just got a new arena. I didn't even know about. It. They got like a big practice facility and everything. So when you're competing, like there's so many schools in Philadelphia that LaSalle has to compete with, and I feel like that just that late to the party with a lot of things like upgrading the gym and everything. Like that, I feel like that should have been done. Like if you've ever been to LaSalle, like that gym is, it, it has been outdated. So I think that can help, but I feel like it's a lot more that they got to do as far as like upgrades and stuff, just to make just to make the school more appealing to um to people that are not from that are from out of state. And I think I also think getting Coach Dumpy there, I think that'll help uh, as far as recruiting. That would definitely help, you know, having a legend like him there. Uh, I think that should uh, bring in a, a a good recruitment class at least, and you know, hopefully hopefully they can do it because they got they got a good staff at uh, up there now. So I'm I'm praying for I'm praying that they get a good team this year, get some good uh, transfers or something. Yeah, and I think you're uh, really right to bring up the the NIL is um, you know we've we've talked to you and some other people that you really didn't play all that long ago and uh, before NIL maybe facilities were kind of like the thing that you could get uh, whether it was you know dorms or a practice facility or, or whatever it might be but now with NIL I'm kind of wonder if people are like okay well i'm gonna go where i can get the most nil it's like your exactly. facilities i might care a little bit about but is that going to be the deal breaker anymore i'm not so sure and i don't think it is like, like i said that's a part of it but at the end of the day when and that's why i was saying when you bring money into the situation you kind of letting the money control control the whole basketball thing because at this point it's like all right well, it's not about not about who has the best team like where can i get the most money for my product at like where can I get the most money for being a good basketball player at? So like, oh yeah, Syracuse might be might have the best gym, but our um like a lower level school is offering me ten times more money than Syracuse. Is. You know, you, let's say LaSalle. Kids, let's keep it positive. Let's say LaSalle mm-hmm. is offering ten times more money. Yeah, I mean if if LaSalle offers ten times more money than than the Temple St. Joe's, then you might land a kid. But the odds of that happening, you know what I mean, are are slimmer. I feel like. And um, 
I think that's just that's like one of the unfair advantages that the NIL is going to bring about uh, in college basketball. Because, like I said, now is I feel like it's not more it's not more so about the school. It's about the money. And it's just like I said, I think it's just an unfair advantage. Um, it kind of unlevels the playing field as far as like recruiting and everything. And I just I just think in a, probably in a couple of years, you know, once they see how this goes, like right now we're in like the trial period of it. So once they see how difficult it is, how many coaches are complaining about it, they're going to, they're going to make changes. So it's not, I, don't, I don't think it's going to last long at this level. My, my theory is, is that uh, once the Supreme Court came down and said NIL is something that should be happening, uh, the NCAA had fought against it for so many years. It makes me wonder if the NCAA the powers that be uh, essentially kind of threw their hands up in the air and said, fine, you want it, here you go, have at it. And they just decided to slap no rules on it whatsoever. So we're kind of in the period of the Wild West when if they really cared, they really would have been like, OK, there there are certain things you can do and there's some things you can't do. But exactly. there's very little clarification. And I think that the only real thing that I'm hearing from any of these schools is that we can't do things directly, but there's probably all these workarounds, too, where. Uh, you know, I know that a couple of weeks ago, Nick Saban said something that kind of got the attention of uh, Jimbo Fisher. And uh, essentially, if you read between the lines on that one, that's that's the guy saying to his donors, come on, get, give my guys some more money. So I mm-hmm. I have the number one recruiting class. So that's football yep. here that we're talking about. But I, I really feel the NCAA is just. Yeah, they've really abdicated any sort of rulemaking they could do just because they didn't get their way. They're pouting and they're crying about it. Yeah, I mean, like you said, if if, if they would have did it and, like, and put some type of limits on it, it's like, okay, all right, we understand. Like, you know, y'all making it, you're making it possible for kids to get paid, but at the same time, you know, you're you're limited to a, to a point where, you know, it's like somebody's not going to get 10 times more than another person, whereas they're, but they're still going to get paid. And, like, I don't know, that's why I, it's just a difficult thing because, like, you know, a, a uh, Zion Williams, of course, he's such a he's such a, a hot commodity in college basketball. Like, of course, he should get a lot of money and more money than like somebody else that's lower than him. But it's like, how do you how do you level that out? And like you said, I think they just threw the NIL out there and like, all right, here, here you go. You're happy. You know, shut up. Stop talking about money. You have your money. Do whatever you all can to get it. Let them but eat cake. It's, yeah it's, yeah, it's just chaos now, I feel like. And, and and that's like that's all everybody's talking about, I feel like in the off season, like NIL does, NIL does. Um, and I feel yeah, like it's gonna be tough. We're we're gonna leave this one because this could be another hour of a podcast here. But uh, you know, there's even the central question of with somebody like Zion Williamson, what's the purpose of college basketball for him? And why is that not like somebody <laughs> that might be right for the G League if you can't be really mm-hmm. Out of high school, uh, which, again, the whole reason why there's a one year delay is to protect the labor already in the NBA. But that's a that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. We started here <laughs> from Gola Boys questions and LaSalle centric. And you, you did mention a good recruiting class. Hopefully it's coming in. But going back to another recruiting class that was pretty darn good. Uh, yours and the ones that were a couple of years before and after you guys wound up going to the Sweet 16. Uh, we are coming up on the 22-23 season. That would be the 10-year anniversary. They also want to know, will there be a 10-year reunion at Tom Gola Arena for the Sweet 16 team? Um, so I think I was, I was just on the phone with, with Ty Garland. It's funny, like literally like 48 hours ago, uh, me, Ty Garland, Ramon Galloway were all on the phone. Uh, and we were we were talking about it. Um, even when I was up there, they were, ta- they were uh, discussing it. I forget who I was talking to, but they were discussing the 10-year anniversary. But it's... Um, it's difficult to do because, you know, a lot of people leave around August, September. So, you know, college basketball season hasn't started. And I know Jarrell was saying he I think he leaves in like September. So when we were up there, they were saying like, all right, well, we would we would for sure want to do it. Like our our plan when we were discussing it was like, all right, well, it should be around like the first game. Like, you know, to, to get the hype for the season, uh, like do do something before, right before the season starts or on like the, the, the day of the first game something to bring a lot of attention back to the school. Cause I feel like the last few years it's been so bad that, you know, people are just like, you know, they're fed up with it. Like they haven't really seen anything since we made it to the speed 16. So I feel like having dumped there, having a, um, possibly a new line up there. Uh, I feel like having a 10 year anniversary towards the start of the season would be a good thing, uh, something good to get the attention of everybody and, you know, bring some type of excitement back to the South. But once again, it's just difficult to do with, with a lot of us, 
a lot of us still are still playing pro. And you know, we we can't we can't turn down a pro deal to to come for come home for anniversary. And when we leave, they're not gonna let us come home for that. So that, it's, that's it's, the it's blessing crazy. and the curse of uh some of these teams that are so good. I mean, we've talked with uh, some of the members from the, the final four team from George Mason and other ones that made NCAA tournaments. And, you know, some of these teams are really good in college and you kind of, kind of think about like, okay, well after college, they wind up going somewhere and so many of them touch the professional ranks. You guys are, are no different that that, that team mm. was very talented. I mean, we talked to Steve Zach not too long ago who technically was injured on that team, but like you said, Galloway is another one. Um, you know, a lot of you guys are still playing professionally, and if you're in Uruguay, he's in Israel. And I think Galloway was like in Taiwan or uh, somewhere in Asia. I think it's like you guys are all over the world. All different time zones. And like you said, even if you like, I think the one year we did, we did I forget what anniversary that was or what that was for. But we did like a big Zoom call. And I'll never forget, I was on a Zoom call. I think back home it was like six, seven o'clock. But where I was at was about to be one o'clock in the morning. So even even doing that is difficult because some people might have a game the next day. You know, everybody has their routine, their their routines the night before the game. Like you might you might want to get in bed early or you know what I mean. So it's like I said, just one of the things that's difficult to do. But I wouldn't mind staying home for um actually a few months to to enjoy that. For the time it went by so fast, like before before they had told me that I didn't even know it was ten years. And it's just like you look up like like wow, I've been out of college for ten years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, tell me about it. Time flies. I mean. Um... I'm personally up to 15 years at this point. So um, it's quite something. Um, yeah, it's crazy, man. You, time, time literally flies. You look back like, like, what did I do all the time in between? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, you've had a, a long, illustrious career. And uh, thanks, Tyreek, for uh, talking with us about it again uh, for a second time. Um, mm-hmm. Again, if you're watching this uh, at any point um, later in the future, uh, Tyree Dern, he talked to us on episode 21 of the podcast. I'll have it pinned on the YouTube channel for a little while. Um, also, we'll probably tweet out the link to that, too, along with uh, this uh, as we move forward and get it posted. Uh, but right now, we're live, and this is this is about all we have for you. Um, thanks for joining us. And uh, just a reminder to everybody watching, too, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, that's at Expat Hoops, and you can also like our Facebook page, to get some of our content and also we have an audio channel uh where we put out a lot of our regular episodes uh you can find tyreek duran's previous episode there again that's episode 21 uh, on your favorite podcasting platform tyreek duran thanks for joining us today thanks for having me man it was good to catch up with you guys man glad to see the podcast is still going man i'm, I'm always tuned in to everybody's uh podcast man especially when i was overseas it was uh one of the main things i'll end up watching you know every time i see one pop up on my uh my youtube so i uh literally just got finished watching malcolm grant's uh interview it was good to hear him talk about his experience because me and him talk a lot and we always talk about like the little things that we go through so it was good it's good to hear like different people's uh side of the stories from you know wherever they're playing that uh, good to see them get that therapy in too <laughs> yeah definitely well, we are also happy that the podcast is continuing <laughs> yes. um as we approach our what second year now uh that, yeah we're uh, under two years we're a little over one and a half so uh there you go there's uh, i mean not only could you have said uh such nice things about us but it's a good reminder for anybody that's watching now or in the future uh when this is, goes from live to recorded Uh, Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like. That helps us out with the all-important algorithm. Uh, There's plenty of ways you can find us. Like Tony was saying, we also have an Instagram. Our website's there. And we're always looking to bring you new content. So uh, definitely stay connected with us. Mention things in the comments. We'd like to be interactive. We've had Tyreek back now. This is the second time. Uh, He's probably not going anywhere because we love talking to him. Uh, And as, as you kind of alluded to with Malcolm, it's a small world and at least with the overseas world. And we're a, a couple of people that get to bring that to people uh, and very fortunate to do it. And thank you very much for your support, Tyreek, for not only being a guest, but also being a, a loyal listener and viewer as well. No problem, man. Like I said, it's, all, it's good to, uh, good to hear different people get their views on it, man. So it's, the more videos I put out, the more I'll be watching. So I'm looking forward. Looking forward to uh, any videos I put out in the future. Um, any get any new guests y'all had, if, even if I haven't heard of them. Uh, like I said, it's always good to hear somebody else's uh, side of the story from wherever they're at. 
from a therapeutic you, angle. I'll tell you one person, one person y'all should get on is Ramon Galloway, man. I think he'll give y'all some good content also. Man. I, I know he likes to talk about uh, stuff he goes through overseas, like his experiences and everything. So I think that'd be another guest y'all should, y'all could uh, look into, and I could even talk to him for y'all if y'all want to. Uh, y'all want me to? I'm sure the Gola boys would love that. We know we've we've talked with them off the pod sometimes before about some of the other LaSalle uh, alums uh, that we could have on. So we're certainly open to that. But uh, from your perspective, it probably is also therapeutic, even if you're not the one talking to us that week to hear somebody else that's going through mm-hmm. and be like, I'm not crazy. Yeah. This is going on to somebody <laughs> else, too. It's not just me, man. It's not just me. Yep. And actually, that was one of the things I think that we were uh, in Malcolm's episode that you brought up, uh, there were a couple of times where he was just talking about, I think maybe it was a couple of times that he essentially got fired where he's just like, this is the first time I got fired. I took it hard. The second time, you know, I took it a little bit better. And, and then he, he paused at some point in our interview. He's just like, anybody listening, I swear that like, I'm not a bad person. And I had to stop. Him. I was just <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Anybody that listens to us consistently knows this is more common. I mean, us a year and a half ago probably would have been like, was it something you did? Are you sure? We don't know. But by now we're just like, this happens commonly enough. It's you just move on to the next. Yeah, I mean, it's listeners overseas. Man. You know, a lot of teams don't honor contracts. A lot of teams will go out their way to piss you off and in hopes that you react. And then it's like, man, we got a reason to fire you. So like anybody listening to us overseas, I feel like, like don't be mad. Like we all, we all going through the same thing. Like it's not, it's, one person's situation might not be as bad as another's, but in hindsight, we're all going literally going through the same thing, or we all went through it before. Like it's just it's literally just a part of the game, man. And hopefully the G League start paying more so we don't even have to go overseas and we can stop stop going over there, letting them take advantage of us. And, and yeah, and to be real, I mean, everybody in the US who's watching this um is used to a unionized labor force in most American sports that have a lot of uh, leverage in terms of being able to get what they want out of a contract, multi-year contracts, league minimum, stuff like that. A lot of European leagues, a lot of, and a lot of South American leagues and stuff like that. They don't have anything like that. Uh, it's, it's kind of just, you, you got to argue for and, and advocate for yourself in any way that you possibly can to get what you can. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. It's like, they, they have the FIBA, the, the bat laws or whatever that is. But even when you do that, it takes so long for for the court for the court cases to um to be finalized and for you to get your money that everybody looks at it like man it's not even worth it like I, like I don't know if I told you on the last podcast but I, I I had I had a team when I was in Greece I took a team to court this is this was the first year COVID started uh when, that that year that COVID started shutting everything down it was that like eight, around April twenty April May yep. yeah around that time I left took the team to court. Um, I, the the court case literally just finished probably a couple months ago, maybe I think wow. maybe at the beginning of the 2021 or towards the end of 2021. I think I can't remember, but matter of fact, it might have been last year the court the case finished, but I still haven't gotten paid out for. It. I don't know when I'm gonna get paid out for it, but it's it's like they owe me a substantial amount of money, and and like I said, a lot of people are just reluctant to take teams to court because it's such a long process. Like if you look at the the bat list right now and how many. How many countries, how many teams in certain countries are 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 being taken to court because of late payments or breach of contracts? Like the number is is jaw dropping. You just look at it, like how are how are so many teams allowed being allowed to do this? And like I said, it's just because the the, the process of it takes so long that they're like, all right, well, you know, yeah, we're in court, or or that, you're not going to take us to court because you're scared of it. So we're going to fire. We're not going to pay you. Or we're going to pay you late and We'll see what you do, but you, you don't have the balls and things to court. And like I said, a lot of teams just get away with it and they keep going. And then next year they do the same thing to somebody else. And like the list goes on and on. Like I said, a lot of people just just refuse to take on the court because of the you got to pay almost eight grand for it, probably eight, ten grand. And the due process just takes too long. A lot of people don't don't have the money to do it or they just don't look forward to doing it. So yeah, it sucks, man. It's, it's, as I said, a lot of people don't know what, what goes into being an overseas player. Like they just think. Oh, you get paid to play basketball, salt, pizzas, and cream. And now nah, it's like a lot of different things that you go through that average person doesn't. <laughs> so it's, it's not easy how everybody thinks it is. Just a reminder to everybody watching, Tyreek's episode with us was episode 21. Uh, you can find that in our playlist of podcasts. Uh, I also have it pinned to the YouTube channel for a little while. Uh, and we'll put out links to that uh, as well. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, folks, we're uh, going to end our live at this point. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And Tyreek, thanks for being with us. Thanks.